I love that chapter, uh, favorite among many, especially if you're a soul winner, right? It's like if I want to find the one place in the Bible to know what to tell somebody how to be saved, let's go to the place where somebody asks, Sirs, what must I do to be saved, right? Makes sense to me. And he didn't give him a whole long list of things to do either. He just said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so anyway, this is a great chapter. And twice in this chapter, uh, we see baptism come up. Baptism is a subject, it's one of those subjects I think needs to be revisited regularly in a, in a church and just, just reminding everybody what it's about. The ideal way to do that is to have frequent baptisms where you have to talk about that. And so uh, I'm glad that we have this opportunity to, uh, to baptize and uh, be able to reiterate what that's all about. And uh, that's, that's the whole idea. Now, we have had recently uh, some good sermons on baptism, not by me, but we had uh, some, one of the challenges for the guys uh, who like to preach were uh, to, the idea was, as you would present the gospel to somebody at the door, come up with a plan or a presentation, something like that. And when you preach that, you know, this is an idea of something along the lines of the material that you would take to a house when you're explaining to somebody why we get baptized and what they need to do to be, uh, well, there were some other things they could do too, but two of the guys picked baptism and uh, it was really good, really good. Uh, this certainly isn't me correcting anything. Uh, uh, but the title of the message to this afternoon is, Why is Baptizing in the Great Commission? That's specifically what I'm going to deal with. And uh, I think that it's something that needs to be taught because it's something that we're supposed to be doing. It's in the uh, commission there. So twice in this chapter here in uh, Acts 16, we see the you know Apostle Paul going out and Silas with them, and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're preaching the gospel which is part of the Great Commission, right? And then we see, naturally, what follows that is baptism. So look at verse 13. See, on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside, where, that's convenient, where prayer was wont to be made, and we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted thither. They went to the riverside to go pray. You know, it's kind of like, it makes me think like we go on one of our little hiking trips or something like that. Hey, let's just go have a good time. Let's have a potluck 100, right? We'll go on the trail. And then uh, one year, Josh Gander was here with us riding his bike and, and uh, was able to lead a lady to the Lord on the trail, <laughs> right? This should be the heart of a soul winner to go and preach the gospel. And hey, you're just going to have fun with your friends. And then all of a sudden, hey, this person, I have opportunity to speak with them and begin to give them the gospel. And here, these guys were there to pray. And then they're preaching the gospel. And then there's water there. So there's no reason that they can't baptize as well. And so that's what happens. And uh, a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, verse 14, of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attained unto the things, uh, uh, that she attained unto the things which were spoken of Paul. That's a prayer that all of us can be and should be praying all the time. Maybe you know that, some folks are going out soul winning. You're not able to come or whatever. Just pray. Lord, open up the hearts of those who are going to hear the gospel. Uh, be Give boldness to those who are preaching the gospel. Uh, and, and all those are good prayers to pray. Now, I don't like the prayer that just says, Lord, save a bunch of people or something like that. Because that's not specific. God knows like, hey, that's not God's not in the business of just saving people. You know who didn't make that choice themselves to call to call on him. So, uh, so you know he he you can pray for specifics, all right. And one thing the Lord does is He opens hearts. He sends people whose hearts are already prepared uh, to hear the gospel, and He puts us in their path, and we preach the gospel to them. And guess what? They get saved as a result of that. So, uh, this is the same thing that's going on. This is them following the Great Commission. And verse fifteen says, "And when she was baptized, okay, so she heard the word preach." It's not like he was there to have a baptism service. He was there, but water was nearby. After they got saved, they got baptized. It says, And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. And then go to verse 25. And at midnight, uh, of course, uh, Paul cast out a demon, which is really funny because this lady, this girl is following them. 
And she's saying, hey, these men show us the way of salvation. It sounds like she's doing something great, right? And uh, these men show us the way of salvation. And then it's really she's demon possessed. <laughs> and they cast out this demon. And then because of that, anyway, you, you read the story. But, uh, but because of that, they end up getting thrown in jail. And then the, this is not the way you would expect somebody who's thrown in prison. Look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening out of sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. That probably would have been the punishment for him if he didn't kill himself, as he'd be killed for having let them escape. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I suppose somebody could say, and I, I believe I've heard this before, where he, people have said that he wasn't actually, actually preaching salvation. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but someone said, what must I do to be saved? You know, because he was scared and all this stuff. He wasn't actually asking, what must I do to have eternal life? But the thing is, in the context, if you read, it's very clear in this chapter what Paul's doing. And several times it says that they're preaching, uh, I'm trying to look for the play, they're, they're preaching the way of salvation. I can't think where the verse is, but in this chapter, it tells you that that's exactly what they're doing. And so it makes sense that this jailer knows why they're in prison knows what they've been doing, has heard him pre heard them preaching, and knows, hey, these guys are telling people how to be saved, how to go to heaven, you know. And, uh, and so, anyway, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Interesting, and thy house. Said the same thing with Lydia after, you know, she got baptized, and her household was baptized. Here, uh, same thing with the jailer goes, uh, you know, to get baptized, and the same thing is with his house, as we read. And so, uh, and they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house, and he took them the same hour uh, of the night, and washed their stripes, and baptized, uh, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. <clears throat> I've heard, uh, I actually have heard people actually use this verse, like this is their key verse, for why sprinkle babies, right? Because there's there's really no verse in the Bible about why we sprinkle babies, because we don't sprinkle well, we don't sprinkle babies, but why people sprinkle babies. Amen. But some have actually taken this verse and said, well, look, they baptized the whole house. Don't you think there were any kids there? Well, probably there were kids, and we're going to baptize a kid today. There's nothing wrong with baptizing kids, right? But an infant who doesn't understand the way of salvation, there's no sense baptizing them because they didn't get saved. They don't understand. Right. So you, it doesn't take much for a little kid. You know, I asked uh, Brooklyn, hey, you know, for sure you're going to heaven. Yeah. How do you know? Because I got saved. Right. Pretty simple. Right. <laughs> Straightforward. Uh, you, can, you can ask more details if you want, but they have faith that this is what I'm supposed to do is receive Jesus Christ. And so uh, so we baptize them. That's pretty simple. And the idea there isn't that the whole house is going to be saved. Right. Just because one person is saved. Look, all of them had to trust in Jesus Christ. And upon their receiving Jesus Christ, all of them, as I'm going to lay out in this message here in a minute, all of them were baptized uh, following their, their salvation. And we should expect that this was the way that the apostles, you know, this was their way, this was their manner, because this is what Jesus had told them to do, right? The Great Commission, uh, I'll just read them to you. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Right, and we know the context. They're preaching the gospel, teaching the nations the gospel, what to do to have eternal life. And then it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. So the great commission and taking the gospel to people and inviting them to get saved. Now that's part of it, and that's pretty important part, because without that, you know, baptism means nothing, right? Teaching them the Word of God means nothing. If they're not saved, they don't understand it anymore. Is baptism 
And then the next step is getting plugged into a church where you can learn and grow. Those are the three things that we try to uh, try to teach. In fact, I've got uh, when somebody gets saved, we send them a packet that has those three things in it. It reiterates salvation. It uh, talks about baptism and it talks about why we do church membership. On our website, there are uh, three YouTube videos that I made: salvation, baptism, church membership. Because this is the you know this is what people need to get if they're going to grow in the Lord. Okay, but obviously we emphasize salvation. We don't baptize everybody that calls on the Lord uh, for salvation because it's just not practical. Now, brother. Uh, Brother David did suggest at one point maybe we have a little trailer and we travel around with a with a, something like that in the back and just <laughs> hey get saved hey look. but primarily in the Bible when you see them getting getting baptized right after they get saved it's because it's by a body of water <laughs> like in this case Ethiopian eunuch you know driving by hey here's water right here what hinders me from being ba baptized well, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart right you can be baptized <clears throat> so. Uh, so that's part of the Great Commission. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because it's not important to the message, but there are people that take that verse and say, See, you've got to be baptized in order to be uh, to be saved. Like baptism is part of your salvation. That's not what he's saying there. In fact, a lot of cases in the Bible where we see somebody getting saved who never gets baptized. A lot of people point to the thief on the cross. That's obvious. He didn't get baptized. But then there's a whole lot more than that. In fact, uh, you know, the Bible talks about uh, you know, the first big revival. You know, there was like 3,000 at one time added to the church. Later on, it says uh, there were uh, five 5,000. Well, in the 3,000, it says they were baptized afterwards. In the 5,000, it doesn't. And if you look at what's going on, they're being chased and all this kind of stuff, the chances are they didn't baptize all those people. There's lots of uh, examples in the Bible you could go to and say baptism was not part of their salvation, but it's something that those who were, those who were saved, you know, what, often what would accompany that would be their baptism. So what we want to look at is why do we do that? Now, yes, we know this is part of the Great Commission, so one thing that we often say, if someone said, well, why do you baptize? You know, even though that's not part of your salvation, why do you baptize? And one thing we'll say, just kind of the easy way out is, oh, I'm just obeying the Bible. The Bible says do it, so we're doing it, okay? Obedience, that's, that's true. Obviously, we want to obey the Lord, but most of us probably want to know a little bit more than like, yeah, I'll do whatever God tells me to say, but I would like to know like why is that part? Why is it important? And if we can answer that, then maybe it'll clarify some ideas about, you know, uh, uh, misconceptions about, is it part of salvation? Does it wash away my sins? To, uh, you know, or whatever. It's funny, uh, that last Thursday, uh, I was talking to this guy. Uh, man, he worked at a place where they polished some kind of metal, I don't know, on trucks or something like that. And he came and he just, just black, like soot uh, all over him. And he's just super, super dirty. And, uh, and I was trying to... I preached to him. He goes to a Christian church or something like that. And he didn't really want to talk, but he believed in, you know, you know, oh, salvation is so simple. You got to believe and then you got to be baptized. And then you got to do the work and then you got to. Do... <laughs> I mean, it's just like it's, it's ridiculous what people think you have to do to go to heaven. But he talked about baptism as part of salvation. And then right before he went inside, he was like, yeah, I was talking about, man, where do you work? Because, you know, you are filthy. <laughs> I said it in a nice way. But <laughs> so he told me what he does and everything. He said, yeah, thankfully it washes right off. He said, I got to go get a shower, wash that off. And he says, don't you wish our sins could wash away that fast? And I said, yep, you can't wash away sins with water <laughs> because you can't. It's ridiculous to think that water is going to... Look, even if you want to uh, pronounce this holy water, it, that doesn't mean anything. It's just water. You go in there, you get wet. That's it. All right? It has no spiritual value, uh, you know, as far as, you know, what the water actually does or anything. So why then? Why do we have to do that? Why is it important? You know, there are actually some groups, some religious groups that believe that baptism isn't for us. It's a different dispensation, and we don't have to baptize anymore. And uh, it's, it's a little bizarre, but uh, mind figure out what's the reason for this. But the Bible lays it out. And so, this message. Yes, it's the first step of obedience. That's what we often tell us. Well, why do I need to do that? It's the first step of obedience, okay? But 
why would it be in there? Okay, so number one, I want to show you that uh, baptism is a profession. Uh, like you're not a professional, but a profession, like making, like professing something to be true. It's a profession, okay? Uh, we often call it a public profession. And so this has brought up some questions among a lot of independent Baptists or Baptists or you know, churches in general, whatever, about who, you know, what is the purpose since it's a public profession, we've got to do it in front of a lot of people. And so they'll do like we've, we've done this time, right? Wait till we have a service and people are gathered together and we'll baptize them then, uh, then and add them to the church. And a lot of times that's in the church bylaws and, and everything. But wait a minute, what if, what if nobody's around except for the person that is baptizing them? Is that a public profession? You know, well, Here's the thing. The person that's baptizing him, it's a profession to him. You know, it's a it's it's a evidence to him because this person is following. Let me give you an example. When we go to the door and we preach the gospel to somebody, we have no idea if they believe that or not. We could walk away from there and that person could, uh, you know, have believed every word we said. Maybe they went in and said, Lord, I accept that. And they, you know, confessed with their mouth, called on the Lord, whatever, however that manifested itself uh, audibly. I don't know. But in their heart, that's the important thing. I can't see the heart. I don't know what they did. Right. But what we try to do to kind of confirm that they believe everything that we just said is, number one, we ask them <laughs> if they believe that. And then what we'll often do is get them to repeat a prayer with us. Okay. Some people, and I grew up, a lot of people didn't like that. They said, no, you let them pray by themselves. So you know, what's in their heart and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to tell you why I changed my mind on that. And I like the opportunity to lead them in their prayer. Here's why, because I can, I can lead them in the key points of their salvation and get them to repeat that. And when they repeat that, I know that they're confirming. Now I always tell people, there's no magical prayer. Saying these words isn't what saves you. What saves you is completely putting your trust in, uh, uh, in Jesus Christ for your salvation. And we already explained that and everything. And so, but then I say, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to, you know, co uh, confirm this and have you just tell the Lord, this is what you believe in. We'll pray. And I'll say something like this, you know, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know, you know, I deserve to go to hell. And this is where you know if they've been listening, because if they haven't been listening, they're like, wait, whoa, 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 wait, what? <laughs> right, right. We all deserve to go to hell. So you see what I'm saying? You're going through that again and reconfirming that they believe that, and that they're saying that they believe that. Now, I don't know their heart. I don't know if they do or not, but, they're, but you're giving them an opportunity to profess that, okay? And you say, uh, you know, uh, then we'll, we'll continue on and say, you know, th I believe Jesus died for my sins. I accept free gift of salvation. Thank you for saving me, whatever, however you do that. But you're getting them to go through those points in their head and verbalize with their mouth what they believe in their heart. Okay. What do you know? Baptism is the exact same thing. It's a profession. It's saying, hey, I want to signify that I believe this and I want to, uh, I want to make it known that I believe that. Now, you know, if I baptize somebody out in the middle of nowhere and we're camping and there's nobody else around and they get saved and they're like, hey, here's water. What does hinder me to be baptized? I don't have to say, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you wait? Now, there are some reasons that people do this, but I don't have to say, why don't you wait until we go before the church and and, uh, and we have, we'll get the water nice and warm and all that kind of stuff and we'll have a, a public display and you'll tell everybody, while you're getting baptized. Now, if you do that, it's fine. It's not hurting. Nothing wrong with saying, hey, you're feeling like it right now. You just made a profession. You want to show everybody or, or if nobody's around, show me that you believe that. Let's take it the next step. Let's baptize you, okay? You don't see that very much in our society now, so it seems a little bit uh, maybe bizarre, but, but this was apparently uh, what was going on. Look at Acts chapter 8. I made reference to this uh, this passage a few minutes ago, but the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts chapter 8, look at verse 34. And you know the story, Philip's out preaching the gospel, gets led uh, uh, to this uh, place where uh, this, this eunuch 
was on the uh, in his chariot going anyway. Uh, that's that's the background. Okay, verse thirty four. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? He had the scriptures open to Isaiah and he was reading it and didn't understand what he was reading. So here's Philip. The Lord sent Philip to go talk to him. And he says, what am I reading? Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Didn't, repeat, didn't preach anything about repenting of your sins. Didn't preach anything about, you know, uh, baptism that we can see. Didn't preach, you know, he just preached to him Jesus. He gave him the gospel, okay? And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, said, uh, and he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. All right, so here's what he's doing. He's just saying, I believe, I believe that uh, Jesus is the Son of God. And he takes him and he baptizes him uh, as a profession. Number two, not only is it a profession, but it is a picture. Okay, it is a picture. Now, we like ceremonies and pictures, symbols, if you will. It helps you remember something. It helps you, you know, when you do something symbolic uh, you, and you do something that's a picture, it helps you. Uh, let's uh, use the example of a wedding, okay? Uh, a wedding is good if it's a memorable experience. I mean, I hope you're not going to forget that you're married, but <laughs> it helps to say, I remember walking down the aisle, making vows, exchanging rings. Now the ring's on my finger, and it's a sign. It's a picture, okay? Now, if I take my ring off, I think I can still do that. If I take my ring off, I'm not no longer, it's not like I'm no longer married because I don't have a ring on. Now, my wife might get mad at me if I walk around without it, but it's just a picture, you're right? It's a picture. There's nothing significant about that that made me married. You see what I'm saying? And the same is true with baptism. It's a picture, okay? Uh, what is it a picture of? Number one, it is a picture that we are baptized into Christ. Now you have to understand what the word baptism means. Now, if you understand what the word baptism means, you understand why sprinkling or pouring is ridiculous anyway. Yep. <laughs> baptize, bap, to baptize something literally means to dunk underwater and bring back up, however, however you want to define that, to immerse, uh, uh, or to baptize. <laughs> that literally is what it means, okay? Uh, baptized by fire means you've got fire all the way, all, all around you. You know, you, uh, if you're baptized, uh, uh, you know, with uh, the troubles, you know, symbolically, they're talking about you've just got troubles all the way around you. This is what the word means. So sometimes when the Bible says baptize, it's not talking about water. It's just talking about being in something, completely surrounded and submerged. So sometimes when the Bible says baptized in Christ, you have to look at the context. Because it might not actually be talking about that, that picture where they went into the water, but what that going into the water represented, which was being in Christ. When we're saved, we're in Christ. Okay, let's look at Romans 6 to show you that. Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 starts out, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? This is a question that a lot of people like to bring up. Well, if you are just saved by faith alone, you know, then you're just giving people a license to sin. They can just go around sinning all they want and they don't have to worry about going to hell. That's true. <laughs> right? That's true. If they continue in sin, they're not going to lose their salvation. But shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Amen. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In the context, he's saying you have to remember that you're dead to sin because the body doesn't remember that all the time. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See that word like? 
That's when we're talking about something being a picture of something, it's a likeness of something, or it is like that thing that it is depicting, okay? And so uh, when we go into the water, what he's saying right here is that this is a picture of being uh, baptized into his death. Now, we didn't literally die. Uh, I guess spiritually we did, but uh, we, 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 the old man, I should say, died symbolically, and it rose with Christ in his likeness, okay, in the, in the resurrection. So let me read it again. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So when we baptize, when I baptize, I always say buried in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in newness of life. That's just what I was taught to say. And it makes sense. This is the idea. It's not that you are physically becoming a new person, right? Nothing is physically changing. Nothing physically was washed away. Guess what? If you're in Christ, all your sins have been washed away anyway. And so, you know, the water doesn't mean anything for that. But it's a picture that you're the old man was buried. The new man rose again. The next verse, uh, verse five, shows us another picture. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I like that word plant. Like if we're going, you, you can look at it a couple of different ways, but if you're with Christ in this, you know, uh, then it's like, because of the symbolism, you're doing the same thing he did. But I like the word plant because you know what? It's also like when you bury a seed, all right? And that seed actually has to die. And then something comes up, a new life comes up from, from the ground. And uh, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. And this is the passage, the best passage to go to, to explain to somebody what the, um, what the gospel is. Because in here he defines the gospel. And how that Christ died for our sins according to Scripture and was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. But look at verse 35. But some man will say, <laughs> it's kind of, there's going to be some man out there that's going to say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool. That's not very nice, Paul. <laughs> but just kidding. That's what he says. Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. You know, how is God going to raise us up if we die and our body's eaten by worms? And, is, you know, uh, or, or what about somebody who's burning fire? Hey, you're not getting it. You're not understanding it. Okay, here's what he says. That which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat. God gives him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another of fishes. All those different flesh are different. They, they, uh, uh, yeah, they're different. There are also celestial bodies. You think a celestial is talk? Don't listen to the Mormons' interpretation on this. But the celestial is talking about heavenly, terrestrial. You think about the word extraterrestrial. What's that mean? Something that's from out of this world. Okay, so you got terrestrial means like something on this earth. And celestial means something in heaven, the heavenly bodies, you know. Uh, uh, so anyway, there's, there's celestial and there's terrestrial. Uh, where am I? Uh, glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, right? Natural body would be that which is flesh. And it is raised in spiritual body. There is a natural body and there's a spiritual body. And so it, was, so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. How be it, 
that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. I wish people would understand there's a difference between your physical body and your spirit. You know, the things when Jesus talks about, when the Bible talks about that new man or that saved person, that inner man, it's talking about the spiritual man, right? You're born of the spirit. You're a new, uh, you're a new person spiritually, but your old man is still sinful. Your old man is still, uh, still the natural man. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is, uh, is the Lord from heaven as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly, and as is heaven, the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we are born the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Aren't you glad you don't go to into eternity with your body the way you have it right now? And I would be forever stuck with a bad knee and a... <laughs> Boy, that's the wrong knee. It's this one. I feel like Fauci right now. <laughs> Wait, which arm was it? And uh, uh, but you know, you back problems when you get up, and you know, aren't you glad you're not just stuck in this physical body for the rest of your life? You know, uh, you don't want to have eternal life. This is why Jesus. I mean, this is why the Lord had to take away the uh, tree of life, right? <laughs> Lest they eat of the tree and live forever. You don't want to live forever right now, okay? You want to live forever in your glorified body. You don't want to live forever in, uh, in this corrupted body, okay? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of, it, of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall uh, be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Okay, I think you get the idea that, hey, this body's got to die. This body's got to be perished. It's got to go under the ground or in the water in this case, okay, and it come up a new man. But that's just symbolic. That's a picture. All right, so baptism is that way. It's a... It is a profession. You're saying, hey, I believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. I'm accepting that as the payment for my sins, for my salvation. And then you're going through with that profession in a way that symbolizes and pictures the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and so it, it, it in itself has no bearing on your salvation. Whether you do it or not isn't... Uh, isn't going to really make a difference. Now we could say, hey, well, but if you take that step and you follow the Lord, you know, uh, that brings you closer to him and kind of begins the discipleship uh, uh, process. And I agree with that. Okay. In fact, I often tell people that when you get baptized, be prepared, right? When Jesus was baptized, uh, and, and by the way, he didn't ever sin. So why did he get baptized, right? It has nothing to do with washing away your sins. But when Jesus was baptized, and started this whole thing for people to follow. He, uh, where was it going? Huh? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so when he was baptized, he immediately went 40 days into the wilderness and was tempted by Satan. All right. Do you think that Satan's, now Jesus, he's Jesus. And he still suffered and hungered for 40 days, 40 nights and, and was tempted. And, uh, and do you think that when you decide I'm going to follow the Lord, and I'm going to walk with him and I'm going to try to seek to obey his word and all that, not for my salvation, but just because I love him and I want to be a disciple. You think Satan's not going to tempt you? He is. He's going to try you. He's going to put you to the test. And, uh, and uh, hey, that's just part of being a disciple, okay? And trusting God to get you through those rough times. <clears throat> so real quickly, this is not, this is my conclusion, but it's not really a, uh, uh, does not, doesn't really just kind of go over those points or anything, but I, here's one, something that I wanted to say in closing. All right. So some people wonder about, Hey, what if I was baptized, you know, a long time ago, you know, do I need to get baptized again? Or, or what is the case? Well, let me say a couple of things about that. Okay. If you were baptized and then you got saved, I say you got to be baptized again. Okay, you didn't understand what the baptism was all about. Okay, you, uh, it, it maybe you thought it was part of your salvation or something like that. 
but now you realize that it's not, so now you've been saved, get baptized, because your first baptism didn't mean anything. It didn't really picture anything, so do, so do it a, a, a second time, okay? Uh, this is why Baptists actually got the name Anabaptist. The Anabaptists got the name Anabaptist because they were rebaptizing people, and uh, the Catholic Church didn't like that at all, but they were saying, hey, your baptism into the Catholic Church, that little sprinkling on your head, that didn't mean anything. And so they were, after people getting saved, they were dunking them, all right? And so uh, that's where the name Dunkards came from. But anyway, so, uh, so here about, what about this question? And I asked my wife for permission to, usually I don't ask, I just embarrass her. But <laughs> uh, So she remembers getting saved. She could tell you her salvation testimony uh, when she was a little kid. And uh, theoretically, none of that really matters if she could remember or whatever, because she knows what she believes now, right? And she and she's uh, she's got her her uh, security of her salvation, her assurance of her salvation. <clears throat> but uh, what she doesn't remember is her baptism, because she was really young, and it's real easy for people to say, you know, well, I just don't really remember. It. I I vaguely remember mine. Uh, and if I remember right, it was on an off day because it seems like I had a, it seems like I had a baseball game or something. Anyway, that's another story. My mom can correct me on that later. <laughs> but I remember some vague, vague details. Did I remember every little thing? Why I did that? What it stood for? How to explain it to people? Why I got say? Why I got baptized? And and what it represents and all that kind of stuff. I don't I don't remember all that. And so years after we were married, my wife said, I don't remember my baptism. And I'm just curious, you know, what do you think about that? Like, should I get baptized again to make it public and all that kind of stuff? Well, here's my, here's the conclusion that I've come to on that kind of a situation. If a person gets saved and they never grow, they never live for the Lord, uh, you know, maybe they just go kind of just way backslide. Uh, you wouldn't even know they were a Christian or whatever. And then they come back years later and... They want to be, uh, you know, they want to get their life right and everything. And you say, hey, well, you ever been baptized? And they say, yeah, I was baptized, but I don't really remember it that well or something like that. My advice would be at that point, get baptized, okay? Because it's not like you got saved again. That's not what I'm saying. But it's like, you know, you never really had a public testimony of, hey, I want to live for the Lord and all this kind of stuff. And so I would say at that point, hey, I don't remember my baptism. I haven't lived for the Lord. Nobody would have even known I was a Christian. And now it's like I'm, I'm, dedic I'm rededicating my life and I'm getting ready. I would say go ahead and get baptized. Hey, I want to do this to make it public and go through this picture, symbolism, and all that kind of stuff. If, in, like in my wife's case, she was raised in a Christian home. She continued to serve the Lord. Uh, people knew that she was a Christian. You know, she married a Christian. We went off to Bible college. I mean, we all did, we did all that kind of stuff. Then if you think about it, the reason for getting baptized really isn't important at this point. It really doesn't serve a purpose because, you know, everybody knows she's a Christian. Her life is showing that she's a follower of Jesus Christ. You see what I'm saying? But if you have never done it before, or you just never really lived for the Lord, and you just, I think I was baptized after I got saved, but I don't remember. Well, then you might as well just do it again. It's not, it's not that you're getting resaved, but it's just saying, I want to make this public. So that would be my advice. And then, of course, if you've never been baptized, uh, and you know you've never been baptized, there's never, I don't think it's ever too late to do it and say, you know what, I want to just follow the Lord. It's kind of like if you got married and you never had a wedding ring, right? And then years later, you're like, you know what? I'm going to get a wedding ring. <laughs> right? We'll do it. All right. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. And uh, just talking about this on the way up here, how the more, uh, more we learn the Bible, the, the more we realize uh, how simple it is and how, how much people uh, try to complicate your word and particularly salvation. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'll just help us never to frustrate the gospel, but that we would keep it simple and that we would preach mercy and grace to uh, unbelievers and, uh, and show them the love of Christ and, and show them the gospel that they can freely receive. And then for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ who've received uh, by faith the Lord Jesus, I pray that you help us uh, to 
encourage them and exhort them to follow you. Help me, Lord, when I'm preaching to, uh, to preach hard against sin so that people will not want to sin and, and preach towards uh, just following, following you and being a disciple because that's what's best for all of us. But help us not frustrate the gospel. Lord, I thank you for those who have uh, uh, decided to get baptized today, and I pray that you'll bless them in their, in their Christian walk and, uh, and that you would just make your presence known in their life and, uh, and that you'd be glorified by their lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.